Disclaimer, please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk, then play at half speed. Thank you. Why are we protesting outside this theater again? Don't you hear the crowd? They're going to close it down. We want to keep it open. That seems counterintuitive. Yeah, wouldn't it be, like, better to support it by just, you know, if we came here and watched a movie? You know, I mean, it's really nothing good out right now. Plus, you know, Josh has got to get that training done. It's arm day, baby. Pump that sign, Josh. Go, 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 go. 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 Yeah, go. Back, back to it. Keep it open. Keep it open. Keep that white claw closed. Keep that white claw closed. Yes. Yeah, we did have some good times here. <laughs> Remember that time Tom made out with that chick in the closet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do, do, wait, what? Uh, I remember it like it was yesterday. 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 Could we not do a flashback on this? <laughs> God damn it. This flashback was recorded for a live studio audience. Damn, Tom, been in that closet more than seven minutes. <laughs> Go, Tom! You're doing great! Gentlemen, Tom Boy just became a Tom Man. <laughs> Hold my sheet. <laughs> Gross. Damn it, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm a professional. Uh. <clears throat> nice, Tom. <laughs> but I didn't see who you went in there with. It wasn't Stacy Hubermeister? A gentleman never kisses and tells. <laughs> but you better believe it was Stacy Hubermeister. Meister, what are you guys Cooper talking about? Meister. I mastered the mice. Wait, whoa! <laughs> Didn't we just make out in the closet? With you? No way. <laughs> I would never do that. That's just disgusting. I've been over here with my girlfriends for like 20 minutes. Awkward? Yeah, what a bit. <laughs> Wait, what does that have anything to do with this theater? That was at the movie theater, dummy. Yeah, it was implied. Come on, Tom, keep up. We had a makeout party at a theater? That's Anywho, not our... it was super awkward for you, though. I remember that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Didn't it end up being... Oh, look um... at the time. We, we got to get back to protesting. Time to go. We want more of this. Hey, let's watch, watch a movie, movie. guys. <laughs> kid. You're almost there, so I don't want to see you give up yet. I know Xander Berkeley and Heat is looking scary, but I want to see you tear right through him on your way to Robert De Niro and the Untouchables. I want to see you get mean against Charles Martin Smith in Starman. Otherwise, you'll never make it past Jeff Bridges in the last picture show. But... If you got the guts to take on Sybil Shepherd in Taxi Driver, then I know you got the heart to go one on one with Joe Spinell in Rocky. Now get in there! Step into the squared circle every Tuesday at firepitpodcast.com as Dan, Tom, and Josh start on their marathon to Pound Town. Taking on all the heavy hitters, going the distance against the heavyweight champion of boxing films. Rocky. Rocky. It's hope. It's heartbreak. It's haymakers. And it's here. here at the fire pit. You're a wrecking machine. Good evening, bots and listeners, and welcome back to the fire pit. I'm Josh. Stage name, Sir Reginald Kennington. Yeah. And uh, we are excited to get the hell out of the 80s tonight and right into the 70s. 
in our continuing trend with our marathon to pound town. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to go from a romantic drama to a romantic drama with tonight's film. After getting the Starman back home to Arizona, we're on to tonight's film. And as per our rules, we've taken an actor or an actress from our last film and moved them on over to this one. And now to get us an idea of what we're watching and who we're watching, I'm going to point the spotlight to Tom. Oh, thank you, Josh. Tom here. Stage name Thompson M. Haddenborough III. And last week we watched Charles Martin Smith go from bringing down Robert De Niro to tracking down Jeff Bridges in 1984's Starman da, 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 and other lyrics that are sure to I'll put in post. Tonight we follow old Rooster Cogburn, the good one, not the old one, to one of his first films, 1971's The Last Picture Show, a romantic drama that introduced us to many now famous and infamous actors. But to give us a rundown of the film and a spot of trivia, I raise the curtains for Nigel. Thank you, Thompson. Dan here, stage name Nigel S. Penifold Esquire. And as mentioned tonight, we're watching The Last Picture Show, a movie made in 1971 but filmed in black and white for artistic purposes. It stars, as mentioned earlier, Jeff Bridges in, I think, one of his first film roles. Tom, more on that later, I suppose. Cloris Leachman, Sybil Shepard in what I know for a fact is her first role. And Ellen Burstein, or I hope I'm pronouncing that name right. Apologies if I'm not. She's not. It's listening. Cockburn. That's how you pronounce it. Cockburn. Uh, huh. I, I don't see a cock in there, Josh. Just mute his mic. Anyways, this movie had a release date of October 22nd, 1971. So we are actually just uh, recording about a month shy of its uh, 50th birthday. So Wow. Cool. I totally planned that on purpose when I came up <laughs> this, with this list. Good job, Tom. Yeah, nice work. Uh, running time of 118 minutes, so just shy of two hours. Budget of $1.3 million and a box office return of $29.1 million in 1971 money. So this movie made some bank. <laughs> yes, it did. Um, it has a Rotten Tomato score of, and now this uh, drum roll, please. This is the highest rated movie we've ever watched on this show. Uh, a Rotten Tomato score of 100%. Damn. Oh, wow. It's one of those 100% movies. Yeah. It's up there with what? Toy Story 1, 2, and The Terminator. Yeah. Before tonight, the highest rated Rotten Tomato movie we'd watched, I think, was Apollo 13. Or no, Shawshank Redemption. Which I, yeah, Shawshank, I think, was our highest rated movie we'd seen so far. I thought we had one that was higher than that, but no, I, I think, I think, Shaw, yeah, I honestly think Shawshank was the highest one we watched up until tonight. Uh, and it has an we audience really score of, that. yeah, an audience score of 80% and an IMDb score of eight out of 10. So, yeah, it, um, it made some bank. Um, not a lot of trivia on this, other than the fact that uh, Sybil Shepherd's a home record. Um, okay, <laughs> you got to get into that one because now I'm hard. <laughs> Sybil Shepherd and Peter. Okay, how do you say his last name? Is it Bedongovich? Cockburn. No, Cockburn. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> no, I'm just wondering: is it Peter B Bedongovich or is it Bedongadonk? I'm going to call yes. him Badonkadonk. It was Peter Badonkadonk and Sybil <laughs> Shepard became lovers during this film. He was married with children to the film's production designer, Polly Platt. Uh, this broke up his family. He also did four other movies with her, including Texas Phil, Daisy Miller, in which she starred. And also when Shepard had her own TV show, Sybil, 1995, uh, Badonkadonk guest starred on a few episodes. But yeah, um, they had a, an affair together and um, poor old Polly Platt got left out in the cold and you know dear god yeah anyways um so uh, that's that's like part of the juiciest bit of trivia that I found um at 9 minutes and 54 seconds Ben Johnson's performance in this movie is the shortest to ever win an Oscar for best supporting actor wait how yeah he 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 won he won the Oscar 
for best supporting actor for this film. And he's only in the movie for nine minutes and 54 seconds. Dude, I saw that trivia. That is crazy. Yeah. That's amazing. Like less than 10 minutes of screen time. And he won an Oscar. That's also like the shortest amount of time for anybody ever. Right. For the, to win an Oscar. I think so. Yeah. It's it, like that record is not just number one. It's uh, so far ahead of every, of number two. Of shortest amount of screen time. How good is that five minutes? <laughs> I know ten minutes. Nine, it's less than ten. It, yeah, it's less than ten. Wow. It's less than ten. So yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting. I that was one of like, I have to mention this. I know Tom's the one that normally does awards and stuff, but that was like, I have to mention Yes, this. you do. Wow. And it? speaking of Oscar winners, the cast includes four Oscar winners: Jeff Bridges, Ben Johnson, Cloris Leachman, Ellen Burstein, and four Oscar nominees: Randy Quaid. Peter Badonka, Badonka Donk. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like calling him Badonka Donk is less offensive than pronouncing his actual last name wrong. So, <laughs> but yeah, Peter Badonkovich, Badonka Donk, yes. Frank Marshall, and Eileen Brennan. So yeah, lots of star studded cast. Uh, even though this movie is like the movie debut of a lot of these actors. Uh, hopefully, Tom gets on that here in a little bit. It's also only the fourth film to win double for both Best Supporting Actor and Actress in Ben Johnson and Cloris Leachman, who won Best Supporting Actor and Actress, respectively, if for this film. I tried my darndest for three days. I could not find the other three movies to win Best Supporting Actor and Actress in the same film. I couldn't find them. I didn't have the time with work and all that this week to go through the academy award wiki and go through every movie ever made to try to figure that out so um i, I tried i even googled it i was like what movies have won best supporting actor and actress for each and it kept directing me to that same wiki and i'm like all right never mind you're not helping <laughs> so, google has failed you yeah well bing failed too you know so the internet has failed dan yeah. wow yeah and i didn't try yahoo because <laughs> nobody uses that <laughs> is this 1998 exactly <laughs> like like Okay. Yeah. Like Yahoo be like, what's a movie? So, you know, um, so that's, that's kind of all I've got. I've got a few other bits of trivia to go through the movie as we get to it, but it involves certain scenes, uh, including one, uh, skinny dipping scene in it. So I've got some stuff about that. Oh, one last bit. I'm sorry. Uh, all the film's music, except for the closing credits and the live band at the Christmas party in the movie is played on the, in the background on either radios, jukeboxes, or a portable record player. I remember that about the film. Yeah. Very so, ambiance. Yeah. Heavy. So, so that's all I've got for trivia for now. I'll have more as the movie goes on, but now for my favorite segment of Josh finding box office numbers before 1982. So Josh, what were the box box office numbers of this film no <laughs> it's like no no just no now this uh the movie total was kind of captured so um pretty much the the information you gave in the rundown tonight is all i have so i'm just going to take that and stretch it till right before it breaks and hold it right there and uh, that's going to be my segment tonight am i doing a good job so far i hope so yeah the box office i i've mentioned this before you want to hear, you want to listen to more information. I go a little bit more in depth on episode 18, where we talk about basically box office before 1980s and that the fact that they were only reported information on really heavy hitting movies. So even if you look back in box office, uh, back before like pre 1983, the numbers were hit or miss. Like it was star Wars that really started more accurate, uh, box office reporting because that was a movie that, you know, was unlike any other. It broke all the box office records, so naturally people wanted to report it. But lesser movies, people did not send those numbers in because it was very manual. Like they, each theater would have to tally their receipts, tally how much they pulled in, and mail that in, you know, through the snail mail. And uh, then they would have to be tallied and collected and sent in further or whatever. And it was just a pain in the ass, and nobody did it. So until the internet. Well, until networked computers became a thing and computers or even computers just in general, so they could automatically tally all that information and either mail the disks or because, you know, the Internet wasn't a thing in 1983. But when the computers became a thing, then uh, numbers became more accurate. Mm -hmm. So that's that's when like even the lowest of the box office started getting accurate reporting. 1971, that's going to be a no for me, dog. There is not a lot. Like, even if you go back to, like, years reported on Box Office Mojo, the earliest year reported that you could see what the biggest movies were is 1977. 
So all I really have on this movie is the fact that it pulled in $29 million and it was in release for 114 weeks. That was it. Like I could probably, if I didn't get an opportunity to search as much as I would have liked mm-hmm. again, busy week. Um, otherwise I couldn't tell you the highest grossing movie of 1971 off the top or off the cuff. Maybe one of our fans could find that information for us. So if you'd happen to, you can always post it on the discord or send it to an email. Shameless self plug. Or I can actually search for it on Google. 1971, the highest grossing movie was Fiddler on the Roof, pulled in $40 million. The last picture show looks like in 1971 actually pulled in, was number ninth highest grossing movie of that year. Only the ninth. Fiddler on the Roof was higher. Wow. Yeah, that pulled in $40 million. Well, keep in mind, this was also released in October, and it was in the box office for 114 weeks. Yeah. So it was the ninth highest grossing movie. Other notables in the top 10... At uh, number three was The French Connection. Ooh. Number five was Diamonds Are Forever. Okay. Number six was Dirty Harry. Number seven was A Clockwork Orange. I did not do a trivia section this week, so um, I'll let you do that one this week, Tom. But uh, yeah, so that was just the highest grossing films of 1971. Okay, those are some powerful films. Holy shit. I didn't know Dirty Harry came out in 1971. Yeah. Today I learned. Wow. Yeah. Okay. That's, that'll do it. There's like three movies on that list I want to get to someday too. Oh yeah. 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 Yeah, Classic films too. Those are on the must see list for a lot of people. Wow. I know you guys have brought up the French connection multiple times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Dirty Harry's actually shown up, I think on one or two lists before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can't go wrong with a good old school Bond film either. Yeah. Well, okay. Old school Bond. Yes. Um, Good Bond film. No. It was a Sean Connery Bond film. It's still not great. It's like, you want to watch Sean Connery be absolutely bored making a film? Watch Diamonds Are Forever. Like, he's at... Watch Diamonds Are Forever. He is just totally painting by numbers. It was his sixth sixth Bond film. I know, and he had actually already left and had come back and was made it... Oh, is this the one after they brought in What's-His-Face to do, like, two films? Yeah, Yeah, they brought brought in Lazenby, and Lazenby's agent actually was the one that talked him out of doing any more Bond sequels. So the studio was panicking. So they backed up a dump truck full of money to Sean Connery's house. And he said, okay, fine. I'll come back and do one. And he did, but it was bored out of his skull. You know what? If we ever get to that movie, I'll go on about it. We're talking about the Lex picture show tonight. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but uh, that's all I got for uh, box office info on this movie. I think I stretched that pretty thin. The silly putty's about to hit the floor. So <laughs> you did a good job. I mean, you got a good couple minutes. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But Thompson, Thompson, tell us about the production of this picture. I think I will. I think I shall. Although now Nigel's put a lot of spotlight on me for some of these things that I kind of stopped doing in terms of the awards. So let me pull up IMTB and Wikipedia, and I'll get to talking about the last picture show. Tagline, Anarine, Texas, 1951. Nothing much has changed. Summary. In 1951, a group of high schoolers come of age in a bleak, isolated, atrophied North Texas town that is slowly dying, both culturally and economically. Uh, I suspect that the three of us are going to relate very hard with this film to small town Ohio and one Kansas boy. Uh, (laughs) Um... This film is adapted from the semi-autobiographical 1966 novel, The Last Picture Show, by Larry McMurdy. It's a story of two high school seniors and longtime friends, Sonny Crawford, played by Timothy Bottoms, and Dwayne Jackson, played by Jeff Bridges, set in a small town in North Texas from 1951 to October of 1952. Um, Some award stuff. Uh, This film in 1998 was selected uh, for preservation in the United States National Film Registry. So it's part of the Library of Congress. Uh, It's ranked number 19 on Entertainment Weekly's list of the 50 best high school movies and ranked number 95 in 2007's American Film Institute's 10th anniversary edition of the 100 Greatest American Films of All Time. Uh, Behind the camera, uh, this was produced by a few people, but most notably Burt Schneider and Stephen J. Friedman. Burt Schneider um, got his start producing The Monkees, 
but then would get out of TV to produce uh, some more morose blue collar. I call them rebels and suffering films. Um, Easy Rider. He did before this film for Steven Friedman. This was his first film. He was actually a lawyer before this, but he bought the rights to make this book into a movie so he could get into the business. And boy, howdy, it's a good thing. If you've ever seen Enemy Mine, you have this guy to thank for it. That was uh, Dennis Quaid and uh, Lou Gossett Jr., wasn't it? Yes, it was. He also did The Big Easy, Slapshot, and Kickboxer. As writer and director, we have Peter Bogdan... Oh, God. Bogdanovich. Bogdanovich. You know what? He cheated on his wife with probably someone who was barely 18. So I'm going to go with Dan Badonkadonk. Peter (laughs) Badonkadonk. He wrote and directed this film. He's mostly a screenplay writer, as in he daps at stuff here and there. Um, He would go on to adapt and direct another McMurdy book, Texasville. Um, He likes movies that focus on conflicts between people, both in a funny way and in a terrifying way. After this, he would go on to direct Mask, the 1985 movie with Cher. It's about Rocky Dennis, the kid with the elephantitis. And also he did a movie called Targets, which I want us to watch sometime because the premise is absolutely bananas. But we'll talk about that if ever we watch that. But also writing this film was Larry McMurdy. A few of his novels have been adapted. He likes the decaying landscape and the world of people suffering. He did the movie HUD. He's also written Terms of Endearment and Brokeback Mountain. Real just knee slappers, all of those films. He's a funny guy writing funny films about funny situations. Oh boy, (laughs) is he. But let's pay attention to the front of the camera. Of course, we've got an ensemble cast, as Nigel noted. Jeff Bridges is our connector as Dwayne Jackson, a dramatic character actor. We're following him from Starman. This is one of his earliest movie roles. Not his first, though. Uh, Halls of Anger was one of his first movies. But this was definitely the one that got him noticed. We talk a little bit more about him in our Starman episode, so take a look at that. But with him is Sybil Shepherd as J.C. Farrow. This is her first film. She actually got started as a teen model, which was how she was discovered. Uh, Badonka Donk saw her on the cover of the magazine and said, yep, that's who I want in my bed. I mean, <laughs> in my movie. Teen actress, teen model. Campaign to make Peter Badonkadonk a character in a future skit. Yes. <laughs> Again, she's gone on to do some pretty uh, solid work after this. Uh, the Heartbreak Kid and Moonlighting with Bruce Willis, which is a story unto itself. And I'm finally going to just focus on Cloris Leachman, who plays Ruth Popper, a character slash performance slash dramatic actress. She's been acting since 1947 and she's still acting. 287 credits, almost exclusively television in her career. Philco, Television Playhouse, Craft Theater. For all of our octogenarians, you probably know about those shows. But she's mostly dramatic roles in her early movie career with films like Kiss Me Deadly. But we know her best as Frau Brucker in Young Frankenstein. She's also played Miss Fielder in Scout's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse and Dr. Doofenshmirtz's mom in Phineas and Ferb. Nice. Yes. I know this film is also Dennis Quaid, or excuse me, Randy Quaid. Why do I always get those two mixed up? Show Tom a picture of Randy Quaid and Dennis Quaid, and he's going to be like, they're the same picture. Yeah, he's that meme. They're the same picture. Shut up. We also have Clue Gluger, Bill Thurman, Ben jo- Jonat- Johnson, weirdly spelled, Eileen Brennan, and so on. So that went longer than I anticipated it, but since everyone else ran short, I think I can chew up the scenery a bit. But now that we know the production of this film, Josh, you've not seen this movie. What are you expecting from it? Um, I am expecting to know what the plot line is 
<laughs> by the end of the night. Sound. Because I have no idea what this movie is about. I've watched like all the trailers and I have no idea what it is. I know the movie's in black and white and uh, it's one of uh, Jeff Bridges' first movies. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, I have no idea what I'm getting into. Um, yeah, I literally have no idea. I mean, like, do, do you do know the actors and actresses that are in it? At least. Oh, no, I zoned out your entire uh, segment, so. I'm used to that. Oh, oh. But I know the trivia and the box office. I didn't zone that part out. But um, love you, Tom. And uh, <laughs> no, we no, no, we know who you really love. I, I'm used to it. I've accepted it. But yeah, honestly, I'm looking forward to the film. Obviously, it's a very well received movie. I mean, it won two Academy Awards. Mm -hmm. You know, I like Jeff Bridges, but I hate judging a movie based off an actor's other roles, especially roles after a film, because this is an early film. Obviously, we're going to get prototype bridges in this one. Mm hmm. Also, I would never watch this if it didn't come up on our podcast. I, I can just tell you that much now. I would never have saw this movie and been like, I need to watch that. No. So if I'm happy at the end of this movie, if I think that that is a good movie, then it will have exceeded my expectations. Mm -hmm. But uh, that is all I've got. Tom, what about you? What do you, you've seen this movie, right? Yes, I saw it a few years ago. It was a random rental from my family video. I can't recall why i picked it up i think it was maybe someone had mentioned it on television like best movies made in the 20th century maybe i saw it because it had jeff bridges i liked the cover i was in a mood to watch a bunch of classic films i hadn't seen before and i didn't know what to expect but damn it was a good film as someone from a dusty small town that's quietly dying, but no one's daring to admit it. Yeah, this movie kind of hit home a little bit. I related a lot to it. I didn't know it was a 1971 film because it was in black and white. Although I should have known because Jeff Bridges was in it. I mean, I know he's old, but he's not that old. So I'm looking forward to both of you experiencing it. It's going to be a heavier film. It's not... We're not going to come out of this one laughing. Well, maybe laughing, but it's that laugh cry that one does. So mm. I'm looking forward to enjoying that. I'm also looking forward to seeing the 10 minutes, that one that guy that does Best Supporting Actor uh, Award, because damn, 10 minutes, well worth it. Also, I, I forget a lot of this film, too. So I'm looking forward to refreshing myself on it. But Nigel, you're also going into this blind. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, what are your expectations? Um, I'm with Josh. I'm expecting to know what the story is. Mm -hmm. um, I have a little more knowledge than Josh does. I know of this film, but I've never seen it. And the only things I know of this film is that Sybil Shepherd is nude in at least one scene. And I've never looked it up because I have never had any desire to see her naked. And um, this is Jeff Bridges, one of his first films or one of his earliest roles. Oh, and I knew that it was a black and white film, but it was made in 1971, which I always thought was weird mm -hmm. because they were filming movies in color long before then. So <clears throat> I imagine it's a lot like uh, some movies like Schindler's List and all that, where the black and white is part of the artistic expression of the film. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but other than that, I, I don't really know what I'm going to expect out of this film. It's got a hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes, but I've never had any desire to see it. Mm -hmm. But then again, it's a romantic drama. So that's not really what, my wheelhouse is but i really enjoyed last week's film and that was a romantic drama and i do like jeff bridges i he can act he's a good actor so i'm expecting a solid film tonight i don't know if i'll like it but i'm expecting a solid film See, it's interesting i think we're into the merge section yeah we are yeah definitely i've said what i i can say yeah i'm trying to remember i think it was if we talk about this being black and white that was actually orson wells idea for this because I guess uh, Badonkadonk was at a party and was talking to him about this. He's like, you should film it in black and white. That really brings out the emotional despair in which I think would make this story pop. And it kind of makes sense, too. This movie takes place in 1951 in an older town. So it being in black and white does make sense in that, in that regard. If we're going by those aesthetic choices. Well, if Unicron tells you to film in black and white, you film in black and white. 
Orson Welles voiced Unicron in the 1984. Uh, we got it, Josh. We just didn't laugh because it wasn't funny. I thought it was funny. Right here. <laughs> right on the fridge. Right here. <laughs> it really is kind of challenging to discuss films where it's like, oh, I've seen it all, but you guys have ne- never, I mean, you've heard of it, obviously, but had nothing, no periphery, nothing to really get you ready for this film. So I don't know what to say to get you ready, except um, they call it a romantic drama. I don't remember there being a lot of romance in this film. Like I said, I watched the trailer a lot, and it looked like there was some subplot about a kid banging an older woman. I didn't know if it was a mom, a teacher, or something, but I don't know. But it's like Dan mentioned uh, a few seconds ago, like he liked Starman. And I know I mentioned in my, uh, was it my expectations last week, how like Starman came off as a romantic comedy with a sci-fi element Mm -hmm. or some kind of supernatural element. I am not getting any sci-fi or supernatural vibes out of this one. Um, So like I said, I, I will watch a a romantic comedy if it's got one of those. um, Cause it could be interesting. I have no idea what to expect out of this one. Like I've seen plenty of romantic comedies, obviously I'm married, so Mm -hmm. I'm just not the biggest fan of them. See our Wimbledon episode for further uh, discussion on that topic. We've agreed, Josh. That wasn't a romantic comedy. That was a tor- that was a snuff film for the watch or watcher. Yeah, yeah. That was a test for Paul Bettany to see if he was ready for the MCU. He passed. Yes, he's very good at playing an emotionless android. John Favreau's like, I'm I'm going to do something better than this, but with blackjack and hookers. <laughs> and then he cram- came up with Iron Man. Because there's blackjack and hookers in that one. We got it, Josh. Again, no one thought it was funny. <laughs> right on the fridge. <laughs> Shut up. Mom thought it was funny. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's my thoughts on it. Well, short merge section. I mean, we like I've never seen this film, and I've I don't know that much about it. I don't really know what else I can say about it. Yeah. I haven't seen it. I'm not dreading this film. It's not like a movie where I'm like, oh god. But and we don't have a lot of experience or exposure to like romantic dramas on this podcast either. I've I've seen a bunch here and there, but I wouldn't call them romantic, just drama. And I've categorized this film as a drama. There's some kind of romance going on. I mean, what what about you guys outside the podcast? What have been your movies that have been air quotes romantic dramas that maybe you can compare contrast Terminator 2. No, I would say Terminator 1 was more of a romantic comedy. (laughs) Comedy or drama, Josh, they're not the same. Yes. (laughs) There was at least a sex scene in Terminator 1. There was. Yeah, and there was a sex scene. And I I guess there was that that one sex scene in Terminator 3 where the chick... The dude. Tom, edit that out. (laughs) Is that what counts as romantic (laughs) drama? You just have to have at least one... And then boom, it's romantic? Edit (laughs) it out! (laughs) We've gone off the rail somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, I thought we were transitioning, so I was not ready for this. Yeah, Tom, so. edit all of this out. <laughs> well, we know what Josh is saying, but I wonder if anyone else has anything to say about this movie. I don't know, Tom. What do you think? I don't know, Josh. I don't have quiz today. You won. I don't have quiz today. It sure as hell ain't me, gentlemen. I did it last week. Wait. I, I didn't win last week. You mm. did win last week. Yeah, you did. You I de- still got the notes right here. You destroyed me. You embarrassed me in front of friends and family. That's right. Well, it's a good thing I did the quiz then. <laughs> Thank God, because I definitely did. <laughs> I did it as we were starting recording. <laughs> it's, it's good to know some traditions just never die. <laughs> Seriously, it's like... I was telling my wife, yeah, we got to record tonight. Oh, shit, I have the quiz. <laughs> that was at like 9.35. <laughs> at least it wasn't 9.55. That's when I started writing the quiz. <laughs> <laughs> for our listeners, we start recording at 10. <laughs> We've been doing this for a year and a half now. So, anywho, on to the quiz. Yes. I will be reading five IMDb reviews. And then you, my two co-hosts, will be guessing on a scale of 1 to 10. Whoever gets closest gets a point. If they get it right on the money, 
they get two points. If they are even distance apart, so if I it's a seven and one of them picks a six and the other one picks an eight, whoever gets closest without going over, a.k.a. whoever picks under it, gets the point. Can't pick the same uh, rating, and uh, whoever has the highest at five questions wins. If they're tied, goes on to a tiebreaker question. So with that, um, Tom, do you want to go first tonight? No. Okay. So Dan gets to go first tonight. No. I gave Tom the choice. I gave you the choice last time. I'm giving Dan the choice. I'm mixing it up. So Dan, first question or first review to you. No. I'm sorry, but that's that's how it's going down. Gross. So Jimbo-53-1865-1129 said in January of 2021, the black and white cinematography is good and Badonka Donk captures the arrow well. <laughs> he put the actual director's name, but I keeping to the terms. I love how I name. made that a thing. Anyways, um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to say eight out of ten. Thompson. Yeah, I'm going to say seven out of ten. Tom got that. That was a two out of ten review. Oh, oh Jesus. Jesus! Oh boy! All right, Thompson. Reginald. Namashi underscore one two eight said in March of 2010. The film doesn't have a story. It just keeps going on and on without anything being its priority. Is this one of my skits he's talking about? <laughs> I'm gonna say four. Nigel? Read it again. The film doesn't have a story. It just keeps going on and on without anything being its priority. Three. That one goes to Nigel, because that was another two out of ten. Damn. So we are tied up, gentlemen. This, are you sure this is 100% on IMDb? Rotten Tomato? An eight out of ten on IMDb. It's 100% on RT. I got a little bit of trivia after this quiz, but I can't tell you now without giving stuff away. So, Nigel. Gertrude Stern, 30, said in August of 2016... The movie definitely has one of the top five deflowering scenes I have ever witnessed. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to say six. Thompson? I know this is going to be another low one, but in the off chance it's not, I'm going to say nine. Ooh, Dan got that. That was a seven out of ten review. Damn it. Damn it, damn it, damn it. <laughs> I was thinking you were going to price his write him up. <laughs> no, I... <laughs> It sounded like, I mean, it was too much of a backhanded compliment. I was like, no, no, this is probably just going to be a good review. It just sounds snarky. Nope, should have went with my instincts. Should have. So, next question. Question number four. Board underscore dragon 13 said in Jan July of 2019, the title of his review was Sybil Shepherd parentheses, naked, debut. Ten star. Nine. That was another 7 out of 10. So Nigel, that one's damn to you. It. <laughs> what is with these people? <laughs> you found all the two-star reviews on this one. Damn. Or the 2 out of 10 people that didn't like this film. Holy crap. All right, Nigel. This one's to you. Preppy-39 said in March of 2004, It's just great. I didn't want it to end. But it is very depressing. Oh, I'm going to say 9 again. Thompson? 8. I told you're doing groovy next week. That was a 10 out of 10 review. Son of a bitch. That's another one where I only got one point. I think <laughs> in the interest of fairness, we should let the second place person win tonight. <laughs> no, no, I am. I am a fair Tom. I kings to you, Nigel. <laughs> that was good. Are you you had some but trivia about the I did, I did. Okay, let's um, Well can... normally we go do the uh, bonus question too. We just cover it but we don't actually answer it. Okay, yeah. Do you have a do you have a bonus question? Yeah, I did have a bonus question. This would have been to you, Tom. But Hemisphere sixty five dash thirteen said in August of twenty twenty one. So just last month, his title was Great Performances, comma, except for a couple. These have all been two stars and four star reviews except for that one damn one that screwed me over but this sounds like an eight star dan what would you have said i'm gonna say seven dan would have got it it was a five star review Jeez. son of a bitch well. i say these have all been two stars and four stars i'm just gonna do the opposite of that 
So the bit of trivia that I had was like my scores that I gave was two, two stars, two, seven stars and a 10 star review. Those are my five reviews. Yeah. Those were all of the two star reviews for this film. No shit. Yeah. Like there's 204 total written reviews for this film. 65 of them were 10 star reviews. There was like five one star reviews and there was only two two star reviews but uh there is not that many low reviews for this uh majority like more than half of the reviews are eight or above damn so you really did find all the two star reviews on imdb i literally did they're all the two star reviews for this film on imdb <laughs> oh my god wow there's well well played i sh- damn damn I guess that's a good thing. You know, there's only two of those because Tom played the music. Welcome back. Um, <clears throat> Welcome back to another cinematic episode of The Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and projectionist, Tom. And you're in luck. We're having a Nicolas Cage movie marathon. Almost 100 movies with Hollywood's most erratic actor. And I get to project them all. Wicker Man, Prisoners of the Ghost Land, Willy's Wonderland, Ghost Rider, Hamus and Andrew, Bangkok Dangerous, Mandy, Vampire's Kiss, Jiu-jitsu. Uh, <laughs> but thank you for marathoning with us here at the fire pit. It is the marathon to Pound Town's fourth stop, and we're cutting a path through a dusty Texas town in the last picture show on the way to the squared circle that is and will be Rocky. Going the distance sometimes means going a distance, and it doesn't get much more distant than this. But speaking of distance, let's see how far the teams come in their latest protest. Why are we back at the theater protesting again? Oh, they're giving away free stuff. Aren't they closing? Uh, It seems counterintuitive. Probably explains why it's closing. Oh well, free stuff. Plus, you know, a lot of old memories in this old place. Yeah, so many. Remember that time Josh scored the winning touchdown during our homecoming game? Oh, yeah! I almost forgot about that. Uh, That was definitely my finest hour. (laughs) And we raise our glasses to Josh, who, looking fine in his letterman jacket, won tonight's game. Hear, hear! So, Josh, tell us how you did it. All right. So we just got done out of the scrum. It was the bottom of the eighth period. And then I... <laughs> Where are those pricks that stole my jacket during the game? Um... <laughs> Boy, Josh killed it in that game, didn't he? That was a great day. <laughs> I still think it's crazy how they carried us off the field that night, too. Yep, that's exactly how it happened. <sighs> I said, why are you wearing my jacket? Why, why are you all wearing our jackets? These aren't yours. <laughs> yeah, we got them from playing Parisi Squares. They got some names on the backs of them, dipshit. Oh, you know, you know, no. We, the thing, we were just holding them for you. Yeah, yeah, we got them off the guys who stole them from you. Yeah, 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 we were on our way to return them to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go go ahead and take it (laughs) down. Aren't you glad that we're here to help? Yeah, let's show these guys our appreciation. Oh, God! <laughs> and nobody
nobody got any brain damage. That still doesn't have anything at all to do with this theater. That was at the movie theater, Tom. Come on, Tom. You're holding us back. Are you sure? I don't remember it happening like that at all. Where am I? Hey, they have free stuff! Ooh! I love it when laugh tracks tell me when something is funny. Thanks, 90s sitcoms. <laughs> but if you have something funny that you want to share with us, or if you have a funny idea for a movie journey, or if you just want to privately tell us just how funny you think we are, then feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just be sure to put Fire Pit in the subject line as well as why you're emailing, whether it's to recommend a journey, purchase some ad space, request a shout out during our shout out segment, or whatever else that you might have, and send it our way. From there, we'll read it, send it to a dusty old town in the middle of nowhere, let it carry out its day surrounded by the trees and the skies and the rivers and, well, just all that there low-key small town charm that you could ever expect, and never respond. I mean, let's be honest, it probably peaked in high school anyways. That's always how this goes. But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com. Oop, that sound means they're finishing up the movie. Hey, this bit actually kind of fits. I need to get to changing out the reels. I'll let you get back to the episode. Thank you all for listening, and as always, good luck. And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. All right. You guys ready to watch a Rocky Horror Picture Show? <laughs> no. I hate that film so much. You don't like Rocky Horror? No, 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 no. Okay, pause the movie. Now I need to go on a two hour long tirade about why Dan is wrong. Muting Tom. Look at that, Larry. They can catch. Fast, the son of bitches, ain't they? Wish I could tackle. To do something useful. Team wasn't worth kiss my ass this year. <laughs> I missed the 50s when you were allowed to bully high school kids. Okay, I need to go get some alcohol. You cheapskate. Didn't even get me an anniversary present. Now you want to go and get me pregnant. Whoa, who said anything about pregnant? My pullout game is strong. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't ever going to get stomped for your own high school ball team again. Where's your school spirit? I don't know. I didn't peak in high school like you did, Dad. <laughs> oh my God, more Hank Williams. Jesus Christ. This has got more Hank Williams songs than the biopic I actually watched on Hank Williams. Would you prefer a meal? Or you can go right now if you want. I'm, I'm just scared to be alone for a minute. I'm sorry I made you come in. I'll take Dr. Pepper. This is a Mr. Pibb household. <laughs> <laughs> Gross. <laughs> If I wanted Mr. Pip, I'd spit in a cup and drink out of it. Well, no, stop. We, that wasn't your cue to sing. Stop. No, no, oh. now you're encouraging him. Stop it. Do it, 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 She's 50. He's 18. Oh. It's still legal. Jesus fucking Christ. How many albums did Hank Williams have by 1952? He didn't have this much music available yet. These are the most realistic sex scenes. I've I know. Ever this seen. is the most realistic <laughs> depiction of someone's first time I've ever seen. Under the covers, lights off, mouths closed. Yeah. Eyes forward, no talking. We're going to put a sheet between us and cut a hole in it. Uh, the Texas way. How could you like me? You put out. <laughs> I'm 16 and I have no standards. Yeah. Seriously. Oh, what's the matter with you? I don't know what happened. Well, put your clothes on. You think I want to sit around here and look at you naked? Yeah, I can't imagine why I couldn't get hard with you.
Mm, wow, suddenly I'm having a easier time understanding why I couldn't get it up. Texas wasn't a state of lyrics, were they? Oh, good. We have a whole hour to go. Are you serious? I'm not even joking, dude. We are actually in an episode of The Twilight Zone. <laughs> it's called The Last Picture Show, not because that's the topic of the film. It's because it's the last film you'll ever watch. Because once you start, it never stops. Yeah, you're taking a break after this one, boys. Oh, we finally got us a team. Didn't back in your day, did this son? Back oh, in my day, good. I graduated a month ago. Are we going? Are we? Are we going to see Randy Quaid naked? I don't want to see Randy Quaid naked. <laughs> oh my God! Hey, we saw Randy Quaid dong. Thank you, Tom. Jesus <laughs> Christ! Did you at least see me. Uh oh. You find somebody else to pester. I've got a new boyfriend, Bobby Sheen, of course. Bobby Sheen. I guess I've just been wanting to go with him all along and never realized it. Maybe we'll see you in Wichita sometime. Cunt. With a capital C U N T. Hank Williams was an American singer, songwriter, and musician. Regarded as one of the most significant and influential American singers and songwriters of the 20th century, he recorded 35 singles that reached the top 10 on the Billboard Country and Western Best Sellers chart. I should know. We've heard 33 of them already, and we're only an hour into this film. I love how they only show the scenes between the action scenes. Yeah, I feel like there's a good movie between all of the scenes they're not showing. You could tell this movie was made in the 70s because nobody has sex like this. There's literally no movement at all. Then again, this might be the Texas way. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe this is what maybe this is the Texas two step because there's literally two steps to doing it. <laughs> Guns Sonny Crawford? Oh, don't you know about that? Well, it's been going on about six months now. I thought you kids knew oh, everything. That's the silliest thing I ever heard of. She's 40 years old. Because <laughs> 40 years old are so old. God, I couldn't imagine being 40. Fuck you, Josh. Being married always so miserable? No, not really. About 80% of the time, I guess. Still accurate today. <laughs> Tom, edit that out. Now here's Hank Williams. Hey, Dan, it's Hank Williams! <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I am done with this film, guys. I felt lonesome. Thought you might want to drive around a while. Uh, I'm supposed to be someplace. I'm still a little scared. Please take me riding. Well, why don't we drive? I quietly hope he's taking her there to drown her. He'd be doing a lot of people a big favor. Yeah, if that's actually what's going to happen, I can see why this movie has 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> and we go out on a Hank Williams. Wait, that was it? What would you expect from a movie like this? This movie is nothing but depression and Hank Williams. So it's for depression. <laughs> it's all depression. And now, back to the episode. Yes. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to be surprised with Dan's thoughts. I'm no, do no, I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm curious about Dan's thoughts, but I don't think I'm going to be surprised. My thoughts are just a question. I just want to know how this has 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. I just. Okay, so like, Dan, go this ahead. Isn't a flaw. <laughs> I just don't understand how it does 100%. It's not a flawless film. Right. So we just got done watching um, uh, the last yeah. picture show. I'm supposed to do the lead in. Dan just took the, took the baton and ran there, Tom. Let me do my job. <laughs> all right. Go on. This film has got us all messed up. We just watched the last picture show and we understand where we got the name from. But I'm going to go ahead and ask Nigel very politely if he likes Hank Williams. Oh, fuck <laughs> that. <laughs> Look, I got nothing against Hank Williams. I just, if I wanted to listen to Hank Williams for two hours all night, I would have just put that on. And then I would have shot myself. <laughs> Tell really, us how Dan. you really feel, Dan. <laughs> yes. I'm just saying, we looked up, I looked up Hank Williams facts. They found out he's like, he recorded like 35 songs or he recorded 35 singles. And uh, we heard all of them tonight in this movie. The longest stretch it went was like seven minutes without a Hank Williams song. Yeah, but enough about that, because I could rant about that. How does this movie have 100% on Rotten Tomatoes? It's not perfect. It's not a flawless film. I would dare say that it has a higher rating than The Shawshank Redemption, and that's a better movie. I don't know. I, I, I don't even really know what this movie was, other than a Hank Williams biopic. No, it was just, wasn't really a biopic, but... It was a movie. It was it was a movie that, uh, featuring Hank Williams' music, with 
I don't know what about. I guess I don't really even know who the main character is, but now I'm starting to lean towards what Tom was saying earlier, that the town was the character. Like, the town was the main character. It also felt like it was a kind of, not discombobulated, but just kind of like a collection of stories around town. Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind of what, it, oh my God, this was like the, the that Simpsons episode called like 40 things to do around Springfield, except there was no comedy. <laughs> like, oh my God, there was like an episode of the Simpsons in like the eighth or ninth season. It was like 40 some odd stories about Springfield. And it was all these like, interconnecting stories, but they were all like, like two to five minutes long a piece. The one I remember the most is the tall guy driving the little car that got out and made Nelson walk. Oh, he pulled his pants down. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Other than that. No. Um, that's what this movie was. This movie was that Simpsons episode without the comedy. None of the comedy. There's not a single scene that makes you laugh other than like awkward kind of laughing. Mm-hmm. Like that awkward kind of, you know, secondhand embarrassment kind of laughing. <laughs> um, but that's all I, I don't know. I just I, I really don't even know if this was a good movie or a bad movie or an indifferent film. I'm still kind of processing it, but I'm not sure I like it. I don't understand how it has a hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes. This is not a perfect film. I want to know where it was a perfect film. So I'm, I'm just going to keep ranting because I'm still pissed off that every Hank Williams song was in this movie every seven minutes, a new one. Um, Tom, your thoughts. I, you're actually, do you mind if I punt this over to Josh? Cause I've, this is my second time. And personally, I want to hear his thoughts too. Cause I, I want you to go first, follow the script. Cause I want to be last this time. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Okay. So Nigel, your critiques on the film are not wrong. This kind of is a film. A, a, I'm not going to say it's a, a film about nothing. I still love this film or enjoy this film. It is an honest film in terms of a story. This is kind of that anti high school nostalgia period piece that you see where you're looking back fondly at this point in time. Like we see a lot with these eighties films now where it's just like, man, wasn't it great to be in high school in our old hometown? Okay, I'll, is... I can, I'll see that. I see that, yeah. Yeah, this is the antithesis of this. The sex scenes were not glamorous because sex is not glamorous, especially not in high school. Yeah. Everyone is miserable because the town is miserable. All these kids that are coming out, they're graduating. They're surrounded by the adults that they're going to become. And they're all miserable. This is misery feeding a cycle of misery. And the best you can hope for is death or going to Korea. That's all you have to look forward to. So from my end, that's why I enjoy this film. And I see a lot of our old hometown in this movie. And because I have moved out of it. And have been moved out of that town for, well, it was 10 plus years. The first time I saw it, it is now a bit longer. I am divorced from it. I can watch this film and see all of these miserable people who will die in this town that doesn't even have a theater anymore. And be like, thank fuck I got out. Because that could be me. Yeah, I can see that. I've got a f- additional thoughts regarding the um, some of the cinematography and the choices, especially when it came to the sex scenes and the more the monologues from some of the older characters. But I am really interested in Josh's opinions. Josh, what did you think of this film? Hundred percent honest. I liked it. <laughs> Oh my god! I lost that bet. Holy <laughs> shit! Like all in all, like I don't think it's the greatest movie ever. I understand Dan's issues with it. Um, I definitely think that the movie isn't perfect, but all in all, I thought that the movie was uh, it was slow. I'm not gonna say it was a well paced movie, but um, and I'm not gonna give it like a high review. I definitely wouldn't give it a hundred percent, and I definitely wouldn't give it an eight out of ten, but. I overall, I, 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 I liked the movie, I, especially, 
I know I've mentioned it before, but I like movies with a depressing ending. Mm-hmm. Like, um, and by God, this movie had the depressing ending. Yeah, and it's like towards the end, I really started to understand why it was so slow in the first half, because the first half was very much a buildup of trying to get you to understand the character interactions, mm-hmm. and then the second half was a deconstruction of those character interactions. Yeah, like JC, it's like we were originally built up with her, and that was uh the. Sybil Shepherd character. Yeah. She was supposed like this. Uh, she was the golden child. And then you were supposed to fall in love with her in the first half. And then she just turns into this epic bitch in the second half of the movie. Mm-hmm. And then even the poppy character, you know, it's like, oh, he's found this one. He's found romance where romance shouldn't be found with the uh, coach's wife. And then he just tears that apart. And it's just, it's sad and it's depressing. And it's like all of like Tom touched on it. The sex scenes, like I f- loved the way that they did those because it was awkward. It was awkward. It was just uncomfortable. And it was just, it felt bad. Like that one scene where he first slept with the uh, coach's wife and like, they're sitting there undressing. That was just, it hung on that scene just a little bit longer to make it uncomfortable. Like she's sitting here trying to pull her dress over her head and it's like, she gets stuck. So she's got to pull it, it flops her head out. And I'm just like, that's about how awkward it was the first time you have sex. And yeah. like, <laughs> yes. And just the whole thing, like how the town is well, just slowly it got, like it got stuck because they're both so nervous and like, she's nervous. Well, I, you know what? Yeah. I'll do that. on merge thoughts. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah. Keep going. But it's like, and on top of that, it's like, this town and the, it's the focal point of this reminds me so much of my hometown, yeah. like so much. Like I grew up in BFE, Kansas. My town had a population of like 20,000 growing up and it was the biggest town within a four hour drive. And it's just like, as I grew up, the town died. And I felt that in this movie because this movie took place over like a year's uh, time frame, And the town just like, it was already on its death throes at the beginning and you just got to watch the town die through the movie it was not a happy film and it was not a fast-paced film but i found it kind of interesting yeah and i think in the end i did like the movie so like go ahead go, all right yeah that's that's all i have for my thoughts um we can go on to the uh well i'm thought. i was just getting ready to say i'm actually starting to do a reverse natural of this film a reverse natural yeah i'm starting to come around to it Whereas the natural, I started off liking it, and then I started hearing your guys' thoughts, and you guys are picking the holes up on it. And I'm like, you know what? This wasn't a good movie. <laughs> you know, well, this movie, you're, you guys are making your points, and I'm all of a sudden like, you know what? Damn it, they're right. Mm-hmm. It's like I, th- that sex scene you were just talking about where she got the dress stuck, and, sh- and she's like trying to pull. It's like they're both so nervous during that scene, and he's nervous, obviously, because it's his first time, and she's older than him. And she's nervous, even though, uh, uh, you know, a woman her age, she's definitely had sex before, but she's doing something she shouldn't be doing, cheating on her husband. So she's nervous, too. So she forgot to loosen a button. That's Mm -hmm. why the dress got stuck, you know, and yeah, just little little things like that. So I'm I'm starting to come around on this film. I still hate Hank Williams. I (laughs) You know, I got something I just thought of about that. My hometown had one major radio station that like one radio station that you could hear and like that they would play the same, like 10 songs all the time. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like if you were in the right part of town, you could pick up on like Guyman's radio station. Mm -hmm. I think it was called the boss. But if you wanted anywhere in town, you had to listen to KSCB. Yeah. And oh my God, KSCB had the same 10 fucking songs all the time. That's it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, so it's like you're I kind of got. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say back then, too. Obviously, I mean, obviously, 1950s, there's no automation. There's no MP3s. There's no endless catalog. You're at the mercy of whatever records the radio station happens to have. You're also at the mer- mercy of whatever the DJ wants to listen to. Yeah. So if that particular DJ liked Hank Williams, well, you're listening to Hank yeah, Williams. You're listening to Hank Williams that night. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what it was like in my home. If you wanted to listen to the radio, you. If you were in the right part of town, you might pick up on another town's radio because mm-hmm. we didn't have the Internet. So we, it's like you were forced to listen to the same 10 fucking songs. Remember this summer that um, Wallflowers, uh, what was that one song? Uh, one one headlight. headlight. One Headlight came out or uh, 
Drops of Jupiter or whatever it was. Yeah. Oh my God, yes. Yeah, those songs played every third song in my hometown. Oh God. And it's like listening to the Hank Williams and then Dan bitching about it. I was getting flashbacks to growing up in my hometown. <laughs> Vietnam flashbacks. Only yeah, instead like, of a fortunate son, it's drops of Jupiter. Oh my God. I remember it's like you turn it on and then you're like, oh, I went on like, I remember one summer I went on vacation to like another city. And uh, like they had more than five radio stations. And it's like, I didn't hear drop. I heard drops of Jupiter once. That, it was that summer or something, and I heard it once. I'm like, oh, my God. This is the first time I've heard it in a week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, 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 I'm I, starting to come around on this movie. This movie's definitely, Tom's right. This is the antithesis of those preppy, flashbacky, high school was the peak of our lives kind of movie. This movie shows just how miserable of an existence you have if, your high, if high school really was the peak of your life. Yeah, like, yeah. Cause like those same old guys bitching about the high school football team, like that, that really hit home. Cause I growing up in Piqua, Piqua had a, you know, obviously a football team and, and everyone loved it. And, and it's, you know, there's nothing wrong with small town Friday night football. That is, that's Americana to me. Like that's America to me. It's small town Friday night football. But I do remember old guys at football games getting irrationally angry that high school kids weren't executing plays like pros. Yeah. 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 Like, you know, they're still learning how to put their socks on before their shoes. Like you can't expect them to be executing these moves at the same level. The guys you watch on Sundays or even the kids you watch on Saturdays. I do remember that. And I I remember like, you know, my brother played and and he said that people would get upset with the coach if he didn't do these things or, or or if they they underperformed in the season, they talk about that the coach needs to be fire but the coach is also a teacher at the high school so it's like uh it's a game played by kids <laughs> you know it's yeah. like yeah so i do remember that like and so some of the, the the old guys just giving them shit for you know well your game sucked last night you boys are just terrible <laughs> like mm-hmm. yeah, learn to tackle yeah and th- yeah, this film definitely captured that and this the how no one has any sense of time like near the end where the guy's talking to uh, the kids, so it's like, yeah, this new generation of players, man, they're so much better. Not like your generation. You were fine in your generation. When did you graduate again? Three last months. year. Last year. <laughs> oh, the, no concept of time. Time has stopped for them. Right. They're stuck in that whatever moment that is. Yeah. At the beginning of this film, it, we talked about how it felt or at least was shot like a horror film. It kind of is like a horror film. It is yeah. it without the well, murder actually, cloud. It, I, think yeah. I, I think I made the remark, it's an episode of The Twilight Zone. They never get out of that town. Yeah. And the, only, and the only one that did get out of that town had to go to war. Yeah. You know, so I, I did like how they left that ending open. Like, you don't know if Dwayne died in Korea or not. You know, I mean... I, like I said, I, I'm actually starting to come around. I, I think I think I like this movie. I think I enjoyed it. Nice. Yeah, like it may be a while before I watch it again. Yeah. But like, honestly, if I was to sum it up, I would say it's the final death of the town. Yes. Like as everything was happening. The town is dying. Yeah. That's what the film, the last leg that, of the town's like its final breath or whatever. Yeah. Well, and they, they kind of hung on that too. That the last shot of the film is the, uh, the movie theater, the picture show closed. Yeah. And the tumbleweeds blowing through the town. And you know, and you know that like by the time the movie ends, it's 1952, 1953. We're, it's right on the cusp of the big boom of the mid fifties, the highways getting built. Yeah. I, I guarantee the highway bypasses that town completely. So, oh yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Cause I was, they were talking, if you heard in the background on the radio on one of them, they were talking about re- the Republican uh, nominees for president and they had one. And then the other, the second one that they mentioned was uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Yeah, Adlai Adlai Stevenson was the Democrat candidate and Dwight Eisenhower was a Republican Mm -hmm. because uh, Truman didn't run again. And and it, I, you say the fil- town was dying. I, I think it was a lot like our old hometowns. It was dead. Just no one was yeah. there mm. to think, admit it. I, I'd have to watch the movie again, but I think the implication was that it was a boom town in the early, in the turn of the century, like it was an oil town and or it was a town that was created near oil derricks or oil fields that were booming mm-hmm. and the oil was either dry. Cause they do mention a couple of times, like they, they were trying to tap new oil veins and they weren't as um, big as the ones that they, they found decades ago. Yeah. They, like someone does mention that the, the oil was drying up 
And that happened a lot in Texas, especially in the 1950s. There was a ton of boom towns that started in the 1910s, 1920s. And by the 1960s, they were dead. They were gone. Like the, the towns were gone because the oil fields had moved. Yeah, it's it. This film captured all that. It captured the mood, the essence, just this mm. misery wrapped in despair with no escape except maybe death. Yeah. And, and I did I do want to point out some of the cinema, cinematography I liked. It's like it was all very steady and with the exception mm-hmm. of a few monologues like um the five, the 10 minute one where that the dude won the Oscar for. And I can't remember um, what's her name now, but the um, the waitress. I mean, it's like Genevieve. Yeah, Genevieve. When they're, they're just trying to connect with these kids about the the moments they had when they were their age, those nostalgic points in their time. Now they're just trying to they're stuck without them. Just then you'd pan in and then you just pan back out. And that was about the only motion you ever really got. In this film, everything was this steady cam, a close up, uh, a wide shot, no movement at all, except whatever you occasionally follow the characters. Hmm. Um, but that was it. It's like, the, Wonder- even- go ahead, Josh. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. No, no, as I was wrapping up, it's like even the camera was just like stuck in that town. It couldn't. No, move. That's a, a, That's like an interesting way you say like it zoomed in on the old people. It's like they're trying to tell them what not to do or to help them not become them. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we don't want to pass the torch to you. Yes. But on the same vein, some of them were like, kind of like growing up in a town where a lot of people never really lived outside of the city limits. You know, Josh, you, you grew up in a small town too. You grew up in a a smaller town than Tom and I did. I know you mentioned in the, in the, in the episode, like, Oh, well you guys had date was 45 minutes away. You have no idea. It's like, there were so many people in our town that Dayton might as well have been another country away. Yeah. There were people that didn't go outside the County line. Like I worked at an auto parts store and one time we were out of a particular part, but I looked and found it at another auto parts store, the same chain the next town over in Troy and pick what a Troy was only a seven and a half minute drive. And I remember this guy just banging on the counter, getting mad saying, you expect me to drive all the way to Troy to get that part. I would. Yeah. Like, yeah. I didn't think nothing of it. Like I drive a half hour to get to most people in Columbus. Yeah. I drive 30 minutes to work every day. Like I don't think nothing of it, but this guy, I, I still remember. I'll never forget this guy just banging on the counter. So angry. Because he had to go all the way to Troy to get that part. I'm like, dude, it's an hour. It would be an hour like, out wait, of your 15 time. 15 minutes, I'll go grab it for you. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. I can walk there. Yeah. So, yeah. The only difference between that story and if you went to a place in my hometown is they would be like, well, we don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You were saying a city the size of Piqua was three hours away for you. city the size of Dayton was about three hours, three or four hours away. We had Wichita and Amarillo. Yeah, they were about four hours away. Denver was about five, five and a half hours away. Yeah. Oklahoma City was about five, five hours away. Damn. So literally middle of nowhere. So if like I remember growing up, it's like if you wanted a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles toy and you went to the store, they would only have the one character that nobody wanted. (laughs) So like I remember one time I went and they had a Raphael. I think it was like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3. Don't hate me. I was 10. Um, I wanted all four of the turtles from Turtles 3. And, you know, it was easy to get like, was it like Donatello and Michelangelo or something? Because, you know, those were like the least favorites of most people. I was always a Donatello fan. So getting him first was okay for me. But um, it's like you could never get Leonardo or Raphael. And I remember I they got a Raphael in and I begged and I begged and I begged my mom to let me get it because I knew even in my hometown you're not going to get this thing ever again the only chance you have is if it's in the store and you buy it then and there because there was no internet there was no mail order catalog it's like that's what you got because there was one store you could go to and get it from yeah Mm -hmm. so she she ended up buying it she got pissed at me and she kept it up in the cabinet for like a month but I was okay with that because I had it See, if I were the director of this film, I would have done a slow pan on Josh during that story. The despair in his face as he's recalling this and then pan back. (laughs) Kids, we've learned a lesson. 
<laughs> right. Uh, yeah. So I, I think I've come around on this film. I think I like it. Oh, I didn't mean to like convince you to like this film, but I'm glad you're you seeing didn't. You guys I... didn't change my mind. It's just it was almost like it's, it's the exact reverse of what the natural was. I remember I went first on the natural and said, yeah. I like it. I think it's worthy of being one of the best sports films of all time. And then you and Josh kind of poked some holes into it. And it wasn't so much I'm following the leader. I'm not mm. joining you guys because I, I have to be the we have to agree on everything. I'm just like it, just like with the natural when I started to listening to your guys' thoughts going, you know what? really wasn't that good of a movie and you guys are pointing out things about this film i don't think it's perfect though i don't understand why it has 100 percent on rotten tomatoes i just don't this is not a perfect movie well keep in mind keep in mind anything above a six out of ten for rotten tomatoes by a professional critic is considered a uh a positive rating and rotten tomatoes score isn't an average it's how many what the percentage of professional critics like the movie yeah so even if like everybody gave it a six out of ten that's a hundred percent and you're not wrong there is really no story to this uh movie there's no uh well there is some character growth the one kid and even um i want to keep calling him jeff daniels it's not jeff daniels it's bridges it's jeff bridges thank you i mean even he kind of has a sort of character growth but his character growth is mostly fuck this town and everyone in it. I'm going to Korea. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, he saw some degradation of some of the weaker characters. Uh, Civil Shepherd's character. She goes from just wafy, like I'm bored and I want to be the most important person in this town, to I'm bored and I'm a bitch about it. And she definitely had this she had this vibe of like she was so hot and heavy with those boys when her parents were so against her being anywhere near them. Mm-hmm. And as soon as she gets what she wanted, she wanted nothing to do with it. Like when they're when they just gotten married and they're driving down the highway, she's almost repulsed by the fact that he's hanging all over her. Like, yeah. you know, she's almost repulsed by it. But then like as soon as the cop tells him to follow him back into town and her parents come again, when when dad is putting her back in the car, she gives him another doughy eyed look. Like it, it's that, it's that forbidden fruit kind of thing, you know. It's oh yeah, she's a drama queen. Yeah, yeah. she she just wanted us. Like even there, during the talks, like yeah, we should get married. Imagine what they'd say about us if we got married. Man, we'd be the talk of the towns. Like Jesus. She she was like, you know how famous we are after they got into the fight. It's like she didn't care that he got almost lost an eye. She was more concerned the fact that he got into a fight for her and she was the talk of the town. So it's like, yeah, it's like, it was great. It was like, like I said, the first part is the construction of these relationships. And the second half is a deconstruction. You literally got to watch her character spiral. Yeah. Yeah. And even actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know. I mean, with the exception of Jeff Bridges character, um, the main, I can't remember the actor's name now, but that kid that winds up owning the bar at the end. Sonny. Like, Sonny's his Sonny. name. Sonny's the character's name. Yeah. Yeah. Sonny's like, I don't even think he had character growth or anything. This, no one had any character development. They just became the adults and just yeah. stuck in the misery cycle. Yeah. Cause like, yeah, they're just, they went from the uh, wide eyed, bushy tailed teenagers to the broken adults in like three months. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Small town. When'd you graduate last year? It's like he, ha- he was the assistant coach. Jesus, Jesus, God. (laughs) You know, the other thing that I keep thinking about is uh, that first time Jeff Bridges trying to bang the girl. Yeah. You know, when he went flaccid on it. Mm -hmm. It's like, remember how he walked out and there was the people in the uh, cars outside waiting? Yeah. And like two of them was girls and then they ran in there to her and asking her about it. It's like that right there is just like, that's what they do for excitement is they like, were so curious, but they needed somebody to stand on that pedestal to mm-hmm. go with it, you know, because, you know, she lied about him, lied about it, that they had sex. She didn't tell him that he was in, or he was limp. Oh, yeah, she's yeah. like, she's, she's like, I can't. Through. She's all, she's like brushing her hair going, I just can't describe it. But she's got a wistful look on her face like she just, you know, like she had the magical sex scene that you do see in some other films, like the bed of roses and the, the music and the, you know, like the different types of camera shots. Not the awkward fumbling about that typically happens your first two, three, four, five, six times. Yeah. Yes. Never mind that he was in and out of the hotel room inside of two minutes. Still not that realistic. Not at one point in time did anyone bunk their heads against each other. <laughs> <laughs> This was the anti-Greece. 
The more I think about Ooh, it, this was that's a good way to put it. That is that is a good way to put it. It's really good. It's like anti Greece. Yeah, this really is a. That's a great way to put it. This is yeah. This is the anti Greece. Yeah, it's black and white. There's no song and dance. There's no musical. There's no romantic happy ending where they're flying away in a magic car. It's just pain and silence in Hank Williams. Yeah, but I will admit, what's his name? Ron Johnson or whatever his name is. Yeah, that little monologue that he had was freaking impactful oh yeah uh, yeah he was he was really good in this where he was talking about the whole silver dollar and bettner and swimming across the thing and then like yeah, that was ben jo- ben johnson ben johnson's his ben, name ben, yeah, ben ben johnson. how that came around at the very end and then you finally realize that that was jc's mom yeah 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 and she's she is what jc will become fuck yeah, it was definitely a deep and depressing movie. And I think that's what got me in the end is like, it was so bleak of an ending. I was just like, I think I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I had a feeling just because of our mutual kind of backstories, like small towns, um, Josh smaller than even Dan and I's, that this film would resonate with us at least in that regard, whether or not we liked seeing that kind of reflected back or not would have been, was kind of like what I was curious to see. Uh, I'm I'm actually surprised that you both liked it. I figured you would at least appreciate it for what it was trying to be, maybe in a technical way, but no, that's, that's actually quite fantastic for me. I'm, I, I wish there was a camera because I have been smiling so much during this conversation because I've wanted you to see it just so I could get your input, even if you, neither of you like the film. And this is amazing for me. This is yeah, why I think we you about this. chat yourself when I said I liked it. <laughs> I, yeah. I, 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 to both in Dan, Dan doing it's like, I think I like it too. Or even Dan, when he was just saying, I'm, I'm not sure I dig this film. It's like, but they have opinions about it. Yeah. I, I, awesome. first I, I was like, I don't know if I like this. I don't think I like it. And now I realize why I don't like it. It just hit too close to home. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like there, but it was one of those movies like there before the grace of God go I. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That kid looking around in the bar that would be his burial ground and knowing this is where I die. I'm sorry, kid. I'm so, so sorry. No one warned you. Yeah. Luckiest kid in that one was the one who got ran over because he got out. <laughs> yeah. And no one cared. It's like, oh, it was the, host, the kid's own damn fault. Let's go get a beer. God, I need a drink. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think I said all I can say about this film. Yeah, me too. Yep, yep. If you want to be miserable, watch this movie. Go on. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) But uh, I guess that does it for tonight's show. As a reminder, you can find us at firepitpodcast.com. There you can find links to Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Regular episodes are Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Most of the time, the average is Tuesday at 6 p.m. So uh, please like and subscribe on whichever you get our podcasts from. We really appreciate it. And definitely leave us a review on iTunes or Spotify or whatever. If we get to it in time, we'll definitely read it on the podcast. And it definitely helps out our metrics. And it will show up on podcast searches if you give us a review. You don't have to write anything. Just go into iTunes and uh, slide that uh, star to five star. We'd really appreciate it. Thank you again. Hope to see your reviews. We'd also appreciate it if you joined our Discord channel as well. Link can be found in the episode's description at discord.me slash firepit. There, you'll get some notifications on new episodes, read chats about old episodes, discussions about potential new episodes, but most of all, you'll be able to engage in discussions with other fans of the show. So hop on in. It is a fun time. And you can also email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Uh, mentioned back at the interspersal. Um, if you want to send us a long message, a short message, a happy message, a sad message, uh, please don't send us any Hate Williams songs. We heard them all tonight, so <laughs> we don't really need you to send any of them. Um, <laughs> and also be sure to like our page on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at FirePitCCE. Both are linked in the episode's description as well. Um, I don't really have any major shout outs tonight, but I will go ahead and shout out my parents. I love you guys. I don't have a reason to shout you out. I just don't have anybody to shout out. Edit that out, Tom. I love my parents and I haven't talked to them enough this week. Aww. Yeah, I need to talk to them. It's been a busy week.
so I need to call them. You should call they're your parents. They're putting in Josh. a pool. They're I think I'd be in more pool. involved. In, yeah, they're they're getting a pool installed. Ooh, how they're very... using that retirement money to benefit. So Ooh, it, how... uh, it's going to be fun time next summer. That sounds it. Yeah, how very yeah. uh National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. I dig yeah. it. And uh, I'd also like to shout out uh, Sync Lounge and uh, Plex. If you have a Plex server or a friend with a Plex server, Sync Lounge allows you to watch Plex libraries in sync, not the band. So it's like, that's what we watch these movies on it uh, when we record the podcast. So we are all not sitting in the same room together. Tom is in Columbus. Dan and I are two different parts of Dayton. But we're all watching the movie and it's all synced up in the same time. So we can comment on the movie live with each other. Um, mm -hmm. Great pieces of software. I highly recommend them. And from my end, I'd like to shout out my parents who are going to be moving to Florida very soon. They're going to be starting on their retirement, much like Josh's parents have. No pools for them, but where they're living is going to have a pool. Plus, they're going to be not far from a beach. So they'll have the world's biggest pool to swim in. So shout out to them. Hopefully, it is everything you've deserved and more. I'd also like to shout out two of our many Facebook followers, Mike and Aaron. Mike and Aaron joined the 180 plus and growing followers who we recommend and encourage to continue to join the Facebook page and come on and listen to us actively, share those links, like those likes, heart those hearts, do everything else, and just keep the fire pits burning. And finally, I would also like to shout out Audacity, the software I use to edit this podcast, add all the flair during the skits, give us some magical musical dulcet tones, edit out any quirks and awkward pauses. It is a free bit of software, so I'm not paying a dime to use it, and they're not paying us a dime to talk about them. But if you want to start your own podcast or just record whatever, it hasn't done wrong by us, shouldn't do wrong by you. And I would like to shout out uh, Peggy, the OG friend of the channel, of course. Uh, thank you always for listening and your continued support and feedback. Um, and since we're shouting out parents tonight, I'll go ahead and shout out my mom. Uh, she is uh, currently moving into a new place. It's been kind of exciting and kind of fun uh, helping her start this uh, next chapter of life, even setting up all of her internet stuff like I always have to do. <laughs> but uh, she did explain the other day that this is why she has three boys and one knows computers, one knows home repair, and the other one knows cars. So mom doesn't have to repair or fix a car or fix a computer ever. She played the long game. She did. She did. She also didn't have to move any of her own furniture. Um, <laughs> she, she did right by having three boys. So a special shout out to mom and... Uh, I'd also like to shout out Zencaster, our recording software. Um, it's very handy. Hasn't uh, crapped the bed on us yet. Can be a little finicky with the health checks. Zencaster, call me. We'll talk. <laughs> like, but honestly, other than that, I mean, and it makes our editor's life a little easier because it records our audio separately. So it makes it easier for him to splicey splicey and record and um, add things and take things out and stuff like that. So good stuff. Yes. Yeah. Well, team, we have uh, we have just finished the last picture show here. What a what yeah. a movie we saw too! But yep. onward to Rocky. But uh, I think we have to take a cab or something to get to Rocky, right? Well, I'm not getting any Ubers out here. I mean, oh god, we can't use the Uber or the Lyft. Can we use a Lyft? No, no, no Lyft either. No, this um son of a bitch. Wait, wait, wait. Are you guys talking to me? Are you talking to me? Are you talking? I don't see anybody else here. Are you talking to me? Yeah, I, actually, I was talking to Josh over there. Um, yeah, you kind of butted in, Dick. Yeah. yeah. No, what, we, what do you think? You're the only one here? Come on. Ugh. Dan, <sighs> why don't you call us a taxi driver and then we'll go to Rocky? Yeah, we'll do that. Uh, join us next week, penultimate episode, before we uh, get to Rocky. We're going to make a stop at taxi driver first. Join us. Yes, it's going to be a great time. But until then, I've been Josh. I've been Tom. And I've been Dan. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Good luck out there.
Well, I guess we can leave now. Why? Yeah, did we win? That's how these protest things work. We won, right? No, the theater was actually demolished like three years ago. That seems counterintuitive. So what the hell are we protesting? Well, apparently to stop the city from closing this adult theater. Okay. Speaking of adult theater, that reminds me of the crazy shenanigans we got into on the night of our senior prom. <laughs> All right, nobody gets odd job. Fine, but we're playing the facility level. That's the best one. Oh my God, Dan, he got the name right. About time. Quit hogging the Mountain Dew! Shut up! Alright, set it. No teams, and turn proximity mines on. Shut up! Quit looking at my screen! Uh, yeah. Just Go stop gun. it! Stupid! Ah! I need three hands to hold this controller. Remember how we didn't go to our senior prom, guys? Ah, <laughs> yeah. Good times. Yeah. That was... It was really a lot of fun. <laughs> Wait a minute. I didn't go to high school with you guys. Oh, yeah! Wait, and who did we do all that stuff with? Hey, whatever happened to our friend Aaron? <laughs> he died in the adult theater. That they're tearing down right now? Yeah. Tragic uh, pole dancing thing. Gross. Gross. <laughs>